Hello, and welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm Luke Frazier. Today on the program, we're going to be talking about research on the health aspects and treatment of drug abuse and addiction. We're excited to welcome two leaders in the research field, Dr. Wilson Compton, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, and Will Ackland, Director of their Behavioral Therapy Development Program. Dr. Compton's responsibilities include working with the director to provide scientific leadership in the development, implementation, and management of NIDA's research portfolio. Before joining NIDA, Dr. Compton was a tenured faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University in St. Louis, as well as medical director of addiction services at the Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Dr. Compton graduated from Amherst College and attended medical school and completed his residency training in psychiatry at Washington University. Will Ackland earned both his master's and doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Maryland. His extensive clinical and research experience includes the areas of behavioral and cognitive behavioral treatment for substance dependence and adaptive brief interventions. Gentlemen, welcome to the Smart Recovery Podcast. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to join you, Luke. Thanks for having us. Uh, before I ask my first question, I do want to mention that SMART recently heard from Dr. Nora Volkoff, director of NIDA, as part of our Jonathan Von Breton lecture series, and a video of her presentation is now available on SMART's YouTube channel. Now, the first question for both of you, how did you become interested in a career that includes a significant focus on scientific research? Wilson? Well, when I was doing my psychiatry residency, I actually was required to do a research rotation. I, I anticipated I would be going into private practice, seeing patients, doing maybe some public health work as well, but I, I didn't anticipate becoming a researcher. But I, I had the wonderful requirement of doing a research rotation, and I worked with a professor, Dr. John Helzer, who who had done much epidemiology research. So counting cases, understanding distribution and pattern of disease in the community. How many people have psychiatric problems and substance use disorders? How did it vary between the US and the Far East? That was the project we worked on together. And it turns out I really like numbers. I really like struggling with numbers and answering key questions. And he made it seem exciting and helped me understand that I, I, I could have a career in that area. So from that, it's been a, a long time, 30 some years of research. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fascinating. You tend to hear, you know, someone who really set uh, another person on fire about a subject, you know, who really led the way and acted as a mentor and and really the, the excitement because of the passion that they had for it for it uh, transferred to you. Is that part of what happened? Absolutely. We had a whole series of professors who were excited by the idea of new discoveries, new ways of understanding addiction, understanding substance use problems and trying to do something about them on a very practical, local, as well as national basis. Great. Will Acklin, what about you? Well, similar to Wilson, I mean, I became interested in clinical psychology in undergrad uh, when I had an unusually talented professor who taught abnormal psychology. Uh, she conveyed the lecture in a way that really captured the complexity of human behavior. And growing up, I was a kid who loved to solve problems, complex problems. The more difficult, the better. So the idea of bringing my passion of helping people through complex problems, helping them become better versions of themselves through treatment, helping to connect the dots that oftentimes did not seem obvious to, to people. And so all of these aspects really drove my passion to help people. And that's how I became a clinical psychologist. I didn't know exactly how my passion would manifest itself, but until that lecture that really drew my interest, uh, really captured the entry. And so I, I trained at the University of Maryland where I received my PhD and I, I did a clinical residency at Yale Department of Psychiatry and a postdoc fellowship at Johns Hopkins Department of Psychiatry. And so all of the training really helped to kind of capture this passion that I had to help patients and develop treatments that are maximally efficacious and effective. Yeah, and as, as before, it's the passion, it's the passion you experienced. Um, and you know what they say about people who study abnormal psychology, don't you? 
No, what is that? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just okay. felt like asking that question. <laughs> um, so thank you. And I, I do, it's, it's so inspirational when people uh, feel that kind of passion and obviously both your careers are just, you know, I- I- examples of that, examples of that. So, you know, I, I just want to start out again by asking um, Wilson, what, what new medications show promise? I mean, let's go right to that kind of the future orientation a little bit. What new medications show promise in helping people resolve addiction problems? Well, of course, we're very pleased to have medications that are useful for people who are addicted to cigarettes. We have multiple tools to help people that want to quit smoking or quit using other forms of tobacco products. Those have been a tremendous improvement in public health. We have medications to help treat people who have alcohol use disorder. Those have saved a numerous lives and help people turn their lives around and, and uh, re-enter the community in, in much healthier ways. We have medications to treat opioid use disorder as well. If I had to pick sort of the next target, I would say that I'd like to see medications for stimulant use disorders. That includes methamphetamine and cocaine as sort of the prime area where we completely lack proven medications that are FDA, uh, that, that the FDA has approved for use for these very serious health conditions. So that's sort of the area that I'm so glad that the National Institute on Drug Abuse is focusing on. And we see some promising work in terms of combinations of medications that appear to be effective for methamphetamine use disorder. But I want you to notice that I'm using words like appear and hope Mm -hmm. because they haven't been approved by the FDA yet. So we have a ways to go in establishing their clinical utility in the large enough populations that that we know that clinicians can use them on a widespread basis. Right. So there's that, there's that, you know, maybe tantalizing appearances and, and, you know, indications, but it takes more work, more research to really get at uh, and, and get the FDA to approve them, of course. There's, there's another key gap that I'm so glad that we're focusing on at NIDA, which is even when we have medications that are effective, many people don't use them. Mm. So what can we do to make sure that persons who could benefit from these life-saving treatments actually have, have access to them and use them in a way that will be beneficial to them? So simply taking them occasionally may not be the answer. These are the, typically the kind of medications that need to be taken long-term. Recovery doesn't happen overnight. And so if medications are going to be useful, they typically need to be used for at least an extended period of time. Yeah. So you're talking about behavior. You're talking about behavior by the person who may be introduced to medications. Um, Will, is that, I mean, I know your area is in in behavioral. Um, What do you have to add about that if people are just not taking the medications as, as prescribed or as recommended? I think uh, Wilson touched on important points here and what we really need, and, and I think NIDA has been supporting quite extensively, are what are the most effective prevention, treatment, and harm reduction strategies in addition. And so behavioral treatments have been very effective in terms of behavior change, uh, taking difficult behaviors and working to improve them, giving patients, individuals, concrete steps, concrete Uh, skills in order to address a lot of the complex problems that one might experience. So I think questions like, what knowledge do we need to provide a concentrated effort on recovery for each patient? So how do we individualize treatments to make them more personable? And so in addition to the points that Wilson raised, those are some important questions that NIDA is currently supporting and that treatments are moving in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to use the word skills. So if someone, you know, let's say there's all kinds of harm reduction measures with, uh, then you can actually go through a few of those if you wouldn't mind, but why would you term it as the skills in using those, uh, those strategies? I think there are a couple things to think about. The first is working through complex problems. Right. And oftentimes when you're thinking about recovery and you're thinking about the course of 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 treatment, there are a lot of decisions that are made throughout one's day, for example. However, small decisions that are made at, let's say, at three o'clock and decisions that are made later on in the day, sometimes those connections are not terribly obvious. 
So developing skills to help patients think through some of those seemingly irrelevant decisions that are made, how do they interconnect? How do they end to one's behavior in terms of maintain, maintenance of, uh, of, of substance use treatment recovery? Um, how does it go into perhaps a relapse or a slip? So making those dots obvious and connected are what I think effective treatments do very well. And so developing skills to do that are precisely the type of behaviors that are focused on and behavioral interventions that are mm -hmm. effective. Wilson, is that uh, getting into the area of, of cognitive skills? I mean, smart recovery relies a lot on cognitive behavioral therapy um, and the kinds of things that we do to uh, assess our values and our behavior and our you know, priorities. Is that, is that related to cognitive behavioral therapy, Wilson? Absolutely. I think that what both you've mentioned and what Will highlighted before are key components of cognitive behavior therapy in terms of an analysis of the type of situations that people get into, what their automatic responses are, and what some alternative responses are, both in terms of how they may think about the issues and then what they may do. So it's both the how, how the brain is working in terms of thinking through issues, that's the cognitive part, as well as the behavior. What are the decisions and what are the actions that follow a particular situation? Yeah. Well, so we've touched on harm reduction strategies or mentioned them uh, as, as a category. What are some of the examples that NIDA has been identifying in terms of these harm reduction measures? Now, I know Dr. Volkoff talked about them, but what, what would you say are some of those primary ways of harm reduction? Well, harm reduction is a broad category of interventions that focus on saving lives acutely without regard to the use of the substances themselves. So it's kind of putting, are you using alcohol? Are you using heroin? Are you using cocaine or methamphetamine? As the secondary issue to what can we do to make sure that we reduce your risk of infectious disease, reduce your risk of a auto traffic accident, reduce your risk of, uh, of uh, uh, of dying of an overdose and the other very serious consequences that are associated with use of all of these substances. So harm reduction as a principle covers a broad range of ideas, but such specific areas would include syringe exchange services. So uh, uh, providing clean syringes to somebody that's injecting drugs is a key way that we reduce their risk of HIV virus transmission, hepatitis C virus transmission, and other infectious diseases that are spread so rapidly when people share infected syringe equipment. That's one well-established harm reduction approach that's been used widely in the US with great success in many areas. We see other typical harm reduction approaches as uh, 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 thinking about a, an overdose prevention center. Now, these are very new in the US. We just saw two centers being announced in New York City just a few months ago. And they, but the idea, and these occur in other countries in the world, is that by having people use drugs in a supervised manner where there may be health care available and there's basically someone there to resuscitate a patient if they overdose uh, can be a key way to save their life and, and allow them to move forward and live another day. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are th that's at least one. We've also seen even some harm reduction approaches, particularly in other countries, where they may provide uh, pharmaceutical grade substances to known drug users as a way of reducing their reliance on what otherwise is an incredibly dangerous illegal drug supply. Now that hasn't taken off in the U.S. at all, but we certainly at the National Institute of Drug Abuse hope to learn what some of these. Uh, uh, unusual and new approaches to harm reduction uh, may benefit patients in other countries to see what might be possible to, to help save lives in the U.S. as well. That's Dr. Wilson Compton. He is the director, deputy director, excuse me, of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. We're also joined by Will Acklin. He is the director of their behavioral therapy development program. Well, those are all great things to keep in mind. And, and Will, now we're talking about a net positive for society. You know, it's not about that individual and whether what they're doing is, is immoral or, you know, that they shouldn't be doing it. And there's a punitive type approach. Why is harm reduction? I mean, it is a net result to a net positive to society. 
I agree uh, wholeheartedly there, Luke. And, and at the core, I think the uh, HHS overdose prevention strategy uh, is a really great example of a comprehensive approach. They look at uh, or, or really emphasize primary prevention, harm reduction, as well as evidence-based treatments and recovery support. And these pillars, I would call them, are important in order to provide a comprehensive approach to addressing drug overdose deaths, for example, and substance use treatment outcomes. So these are important aspects that I think really can move the needle on addressing this at a population level, which is needed. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd like to, please. I'd, I'd like to point out that when we think about the harm reduction approaches, you know, I highlight a couple of them for you. And we also think about naloxone distribution as a way of saving lives when people have overdosed. We think about uh, fentanyl test trips as a way of people testing their drug supply for the presence of a, of a potentially poisonous substance in their, in their drugs that they're going to consume. These approaches are not the end point in establishing, recovering, and helping people turn their lives around, but they may be an essential beginning of that pathway. Um, what, what One way I describe it to, to family members and patients is that I can't do therapy, I can't do cognitive behavior therapy or medication treatment if you're deceased. Mm. So our first goal will be to help provide the interventions that will save a life so that we can have another day to help you uh, begin to turn your life around and really change directions. Yeah, I mean, that's a very strong idea. And it makes a lot of sense because, you know, you, you have to first have a person who is able to accept and, and willing to accept help. And there's ways to help, whether it, you know, med other medications or cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's an extremely important point. And you know that smart recovery has for so long supported, this is not your history, the use of medication assisted treatment. Um, although, uh, let, let me ask you have you heard the term medication assisted recovery? Is that something, uh, Will, that, you, that you've heard? I've, I've only heard that recently. Is that something that has, has uh, made the rounds to NIDA? Well, I, I've heard it circulating, um, but yes, I, I think it's uh, one term that has been described uh, in, many, in many areas. Yeah. And what about that mutual help? I mentioned SMART. Of course, there's 12-step programs. There's uh, other kinds of recovery models, mutual help. What about research on the effectiveness of mutual help models? The research has mostly been observational and descriptive. So we know that there's a strong association of participating in mutual help, self-help programs uh, with uh, enhanced recovery outcomes. So with a better outcome. Some of this may be explained by the fact that people who engage in these, in these approaches may have better social support. That's certainly one of the theories is that in terms of a life change, we need to have something that will allow us to, to to uh, uh, support uh, to, that will support us during times of stress and difficulty. And there's nothing like a broad social circle to provide some of that, that support. Recovery is not a short-term process. And so how we can provide help over the long haul has clearly uh, uh, been benefited by uh, recovery support programs and mutual help like you're describing. Clear-cut clinical trials have been rare and few uh, in this area. And so that's an area that we're interested in is, is in terms of how can, how can we use research to help understand the impact of mutual support and how can we support research on recovery? What happens to the brain as people are abstinent and, and in recovery? We turns out we have little information about the long-term outcomes on brain health, for example. Well, that's, that's an important point very much so. And, and, and that support, I mean, you know, the longer you're in kind of a mutual support setting, um, could there be changes in, well, there's certainly change in behavior. What about changes in, in actual brain chemistry or brain science? Any thoughts on that, Will? I think it, it, it is uh, spot on insofar as the four pillars that I mentioned earlier um, involving prevention, harm reduction, evidence-based treatments and recovery support, uh, there are data very clear data to support social support and how important that is in terms of brain function and brain changes. And so I, I would add uh, an additional pillar of social support. And we are really uh, 
funding research to try to understand all of the factors that contribute to overdoses, for example, and isolation, when you think about isolation and how that might drive behavior, increased stress and anxiety, um, economic challenges, all of these are contributors. And, and we have shown that in some research that social support strategies uh, are, are effective in terms of increased access to peer support groups, addressing aspects that could drive behavior. And so by understanding behavior and changing behavior, it also has an impact on brain and, and brain changes. So that is, I think, a mutually important uh, focus in, in treatment and how to really ensure treatments, their gains are maintained. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I mean, that's, that's, I think you put it very well. It's, it's kind of wrapped up in the four pillars and, and really part of seeing it in context and how else it's being... Uh, how, how, how else it's actually being put into real world practice. But Wilson, let me switch kind of a, a well related question. How much of NIDA's budget is focused on medications or, or medical interventions and how much on behavioral interventions or research on both those areas? We have a long history of support in both of those areas. Uh, I don't know the numbers in terms of the absolute dollars going into behavior research compared to medication development. Right now, we've had a major emphasis on medication development through two sources of support. The National Institute on Drug Abuse has our general funding, but we're also very pleased that Congress has appropriated additional funds in the last few years through a program called Helping End Addiction Long-Term, or HEAL. And this is administered and managed by NIH overall and includes the National Institute on Drug Abuse plus multiple other entities focusing on both pain research as well as research to develop new treatments and new interventions for opioid use disorder, overdose, and other related addictive problems. Medication development has been a key component. And so a large amount of the funding from our, our HEAL program has been focused on medication development. I would also point out that some of our, uh, the, the, the research that we support is not just the development of these interventions, but how do we see them widely implemented? So right now we're focusing on, we've developed a number of behavioral approaches, but we don't see these behavioral interventions widely implemented. Uh, Will has been involved in a group that are focusing on how can we get contingency management, for example, more widely implemented? This is a behavioral approach that's shown to be effective in helping people uh, reduce their use of methamphetamine and cocaine where I don't have any medications to help you. And yet yeah. we have an effective behavioral approach called yeah. contingency management. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Can you say more about that? I haven't heard that term contingency management. Well, I'll, I'll turn to Will to give a, a detailed explanation because he's helped support the research that okay. has, has proven that. But basically my understanding and the way I explain contingency management is we use small rewards, meaning uh, 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 payments of either a small amount of money or a prize or something of value to people as a way of shaping their behavior, just like you do with children. You give them stickers and prizes and other ways to reward them when they've engaged in very positive behavior. Well, this can be linked for, for in the drug abuse area to for not using substances. So a program may test someone every day or every other day for use of methamphetamine, for example. And for each successive negative uh, 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 urine drug test, so when there's no evidence of having used the substance for that period of time, there's a reward provided. Those rewards are often increased a little bit each time. Uh, and we've shown that people will, with these very modest uh, extra incentives change their behavior. It's just enough to sort of tip the balance. People want to be in recovery already, but they find the temptations and drug use patterns in the community hard to resist. And knowing that they're going to get a little reward for that can really help shape behavior. Oh boy, that's that. It's a positive, and it's uh, you know, like you say, modest. But Will, what else would you add about uh, contingency management? I, I think Wilson really hit a lot of the high points, and and I would add that. This is, I would say, if you think about it in this way, it's a sledgehammer when it comes to behavior change. It, it is very effective. Um, there are extensive data, decades of data, to really show how effective contingency management is for stimulant use disorder, 
as well as opiate use disorder alongside medications for treatment of substance use disorder, um, alcohol use disorder, as well as cannabis and tobacco use. And uh, as Wilson mentioned, it involves the reinforcement of desired behavior. So for example, reducing or abstaining from substance use, increased engagement and adherence to treatment as well. So certain behaviors that are part of one's treatment plan, those behaviors are then reinforced. And so these incentives takes form in many ways. So there are vouchers in which gives the patient an opportunity to draw for prizes, for example, or other items or services of value. So this, this is a very effective way of adding to one's armamentarium to address substance use treatment. And uh, this is an effective tool in order to change behavior in a way of increasing engagement in adherence to treatment or abstaining from substance use themselves. So it's a very effective tool. Yeah, well, that's great, a positive reinforcement, but also I think one of the keys there is the research shows the effectiveness. It's not just, oh, here's a, here's a fun idea. We'll, we'll give uh, small, modest uh, rewards to people. It's been shown to be effective by research. And, and that's right. really where we should stay when we focus on you know, helping people who have substance use disorders, behavioral disorders, is what's effective, what has been shown to be effective. Not, not just because, I guess what I'm doing is, is thinking about people who would scoff at such an idea and say, well, how could that make a difference? Well, it's been shown to make a difference. Is, it, is that overall with research, Wilson, that you know, people have to understand that research means something. It's not just uh, ideas out of nowhere. Well, that's the purpose of research is to take a good idea and then test it rigorously to make sure that it actually has the impact that we think it will have. An example that, I, that I, I, I've used is when we look at drug abuse prevention. Years ago, uh, our, our public health community started out doing drug education with early teenagers, thinking that if we just tell them about the potential harms of drugs, they'll make a healthier decision. Well, it turns out that, that, that we're going back to the 1970s and 80s with some of these programs. Mm -hmm. just, say some no, of those just say no? Is that, um, this is even before the Just Say No okay. uh, uh, media campaign. The drug education programs with youth actually in some ways backfired because the message that that a 12 or 13 year old got from some of that education might be that, oh, lots of other kids are using these substances. Uh, and so the, the message to them was, well, if they're using them, maybe I should too. So we saw them backfiring in some cases. It sounded like a very reasonable idea. Simply educating somebody about harms is, doesn't sound like a dangerous thing to me, but yet in practice, it didn't work as we expected. So we need to subject these good ideas to a rigorous evaluation to understand whether they have the benefits we're thinking of. Uh, and, and indeed, in terms of contingency management, this psychotherapy approach, this behavioral approach, as, as, as Will highlighted, there are now decades of research to show that it's an effective approach to shape behavior. Now, the question is, how do we, how do we make sure that it's applied in ways that are following the guidelines of how it was studied? Because you wanna do it in a way that's kind of like if you're baking a cake, you, you follow the recipe because you know that you'll get the outcome you expect. Uh, and if you vary it, you might get something useful, but you can't be as certain that way. So uh, making sure that people follow the, the way it was implemented in, in the evaluation or the research studies is an essential component here yeah. as well. I would say just for my own cooking history that, yeah, the more I follow what I know I'm supposed to do, the more I follow the recipe, the better the outcome is. You know, if I start getting crazy or don't have an ingredient, it's going to change it. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we talked about, you know, some of those harm reduction strategies and the mutual support. Um, you know, if you don't mind for a moment focusing on something like uh, smart recovery, you know, we're science-based, we're, we're stigma-free. We make sure that people are welcome no matter what their issue, their addiction. Um, do you know, the, is there some kind of research that could be done, you think about uh, smart recovery in terms of NIDA and what, what could be, uh, I, I'm not making a shameless plug, I'm just saying, I mean, we could even expand it to 12-step programs as well, but what kind of research could we do, Will, into, the, into more taking a look at those mutual support programs? Luke, thank you for that question. And I will say that 
approaches to addiction and treatment that focus on diminishing guilt, for example, and shame and hopelessness. I mean, those are some of the elements that are important that really drive some of the decisions uh, that one might make. So having unnecessary guilt or shame, uh, individuals may feel overwhelmed and, and feelings of being defeated. So treatments that really support participants and patients are essential. Uh, and, and as you well know that a relapse and or a slip is part of one's recovery. And so if such relapses are punished or judged by programs, that could negatively impact individuals, both emotionally as well as physically. So having a real clear support uh, system is, is essential. And so I think that is really at the heart of where elements of improved treatments and also looking at it in the long term can be effective going forward. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. I mean, it just, it, it, these things, sometimes when I'm talking with, with uh, researchers, you know, what they say makes so much sense. And that's why it's exciting. That's why it's exciting to think about all night is doing and others and individuals. I mean, we've, we've had folks on from uh, the Alcohol Research Council, I believe it's called, and, you know, different kinds of um, people in academia who are doing some great research. So it just all adds up to, I think, a hopeful kind of uh, perspective. And, and, and uh, Wilson, I understand exactly what you said. You, you have to be careful about conclusions um, you know, research can take some time. Um, what else, uh, Will, would you want to say as we're kind of starting to wrap up here, want to say about the work you do and some of the things that Knight is involved in? Luke, I think uh, we, we really have to continue to show treatments work, but also to ensure that these treatments are available for people who need them. So really making that connection. Again, it's, it's really all about connections. And so in many cases that requires, for example, the patients to be reimbursed for medications and treatments they seek. So NIDA is currently working with FDA to achieve in essence, a reimbursement system. So also I would say that making addiction treatment less intimidating uh, is something that I think many people struggle with. Right, and, and a lot of times people, and, and there's, there have been a number of surveys, a number of assessments on the reasons why people are not ready to give up substances completely. And so that has been a main reason people who could benefit from addiction treatment do not seek it. So being realistic um, and, and focusing on ways in which treatments can be less intimidating, more welcoming, I think could go a long way in, or, in terms of uh, behavior change and yeah. ensuring that it is maintained over time. Yeah, and that sounds you know realistic, you know less intimidating, more welcoming. Absolutely, that makes so much sense. Um, Wilson, before I, I ask you if you have any other thoughts, I, I did uh, want to ask about go back to the pandemic, um, and I know we're mostly mostly moving from at least the height of the pandemic, of course, but does NIDA have any data on the increase of people with, with substance use disorders or use of substances during the pandemic? One of the most disturbing features in the last two years has been the market increase in overdose deaths during this COVID pandemic, that we saw a jump in overdose deaths starting in March of 2020, and that increase has persisted since that time. We see that primarily driven by increasing use of, of uh, synthetic opioids. That's a, a way of describing fentanyl and fentanyl related compounds that have spread across the country and contaminated not just the opioid drug supply. So people that think they're using heroin are mostly using fentanyl now in all parts of our country. Uh, and that's a fairly new phenomenon and has, has continued to expand during the pandemic period. But we also see uh, fentanyl related compounds contaminating methamphetamine, cocaine. So when people think they're gonna use a stimulant, that might not be all they put into their bodies. And so the overdose deaths uh, related to this uh, uh, overlap of fentanyl with the stimulants has been just really frightening. Tragic. As, as well, people will sometimes use pills you know, people take pills to get high, not just to treat the conditions that they are designed for. 
Uh, and yet now we're seeing that fentanyl has been pressed into uh, counterfeit tablets that are distributed all around the country. So these are very frightening developments that help us understand how it, it, it's not just the behavior of our, our patients and the public, but it's also the drug dealers and drug sellers that are changing their practices and, and putting so many people in peril during the pandemic. Right. And then that's it. People in peril, people at risk and, and not even thinking that there would be something different in their substance. I, I mean, Wilson, anything else you'd like to add as we uh, wrap up the uh, conversation today? Well, I really appreciate you starting this conversation by asking me and Will Acklin about what inspired us to go into research. And I wanted to add that I joined the National Institute on Drug Abuse about 20 years ago. I expected to be in a federal position for just a few years and to go back to an academic department somewhere. It turns out that by being part of the federal government, I'm able to participate in discussions like this one. I'm able to help work across boundaries. And so as Will was highlighting, at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we're collaborating with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. We're trying to figure out how to get services paid for and implemented on a widespread basis around the country. We have colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control, at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. These are all the broad range of government entities that address the drug abuse problems. And, and, and really from our position at NIDA, we're able to collaborate and make sure that we bring our research findings into all those other agencies that are responsible for implementing them around the whole country. And that's very exciting and really gratifying to have that opportunity to try to help people on a widespread basis. That's Dr. Wilson Compton. He's deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And Will, we've been also speaking with Will Acklin. He's the director of the Behavioral Therapy Development Program. Gentlemen, great conversation. I really appreciate you making the time. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the Smart Recovery Podcast. I'm Luke Frazier. A program note, if you'd like to see a presentation by Dr. Nora Volkoff, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, it's now posted on our YouTube channel. She was the inaugural speaker of the Jonathan Von Breton Lecture Series. Until next time on the podcast, stay healthy and stay connected. Stay connected.